Welcome to episode 124 of the Hard Truth About B2B E-Commerce. Uh, I'm your co-host Isaiah Bollinger, and I'm I'm back with Tim. I think we we had a little gap there, so but we have a lot of guests lined up and a very exciting guest today. So they'll be we'll be back on track uh, soon. Oh, we will. We have uh, we've got quite a backlog now. So hey, everybody, it's uh, Tim Peterson again. It's good to see you. Uh, I wanted to give a couple shout outs. Uh, there are always people who are reaching out to us, our listeners, and we. Uh, want to make sure that we're you know giving them some recognition uh and again there are a few people who claim that they've listened to every single podcast and uh i have not listened to every single podcast <laughs> okay. i can't you hear know. myself uh, it hurts me to hear myself that much so i you know <laughs> you know but, but you know thank you to everybody who's doing this i want to uh, say hi to uh, chris timmis again who is a, a devoted follower uh also to bruce dresner uh, and also to Joshua Tippergan uh, and Betsy Emery Martin. Uh, I've got a few other people, but I'll save them for future episodes too. But these folks, uh, David Navarro, I should mention too, these folks have been listening on and off all along. Uh, and I give them uh, a lot of credit for that. Thank you so much. Uh, They're very involved in the industry uh, from one angle or another, either from the investment angle, we love money, uh, or from people who are actually working in the field or working on brands. Uh, so, so thank you. I also just want to give a pause for our sponsor mention. Balance is a B2B e-commerce payment solution that works well for you and for your buyers. It offers a seamless one-click checkout for almost any payment method, including ACH, wire, checks, cards, even terms. It's used by leaders in B2B e-commerce, and it's as easy as buying a shirt from Amazon. Check them out at getbalance.com. Book a session and tell them what your needs are. They are the first dedicated payment platform for B2B e-commerce, 100% tailored to your needs. Thanks again to our sponsor, Balance. Thanks. I hope that was enough for our team to uh, insert uh, that in Joshua. Uh, Joshua, Whew, should I just mention his name? Isaiah, uh, <laughs> let me throw it back to you. And, it's a little uh, bit of a biblical aspect, so you could, I, I, could, I get Isaac a lot. But um, <laughs> I know, uh, it's uh, like I just mentioned his name, so I had to say it again. There no, you. no worries. I feel like I do. I'm, I, my names are getting harder and harder for me as I get uh, older. But um, I'm very excited to... Uh, introduce uh, Kevin and Beth. Uh, Kevin, we've known for a, a while now, going pre-Trade uh, Centric. And Beth, I believe you're relatively new in the CEO role at, at Trade Centric. Uh, for people who maybe know the old brand, it was previously Punch Out to Go. We actually had them on the podcast to, I think, announce the rebrand. It was two years ago. Um, and Kevin uh, is someone we've been in touch with from the partnership and sales side for, I don't know, was it at, I think it was at ship station or maybe even before that. I, I'm like, I can't, I'd have to go back to like when we first met you, Kevin, but it's been a while. <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah. thanks, thanks for joining. And uh, I guess Ke Kevin, I'll let you go first since uh, you know, I've no, we'll save Beth for, for after just to kind of add to your eyes introduction. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, thanks. Thanks for having uh, us on the podcast today. Um, I'm Kevin Kazmaier, as mentioned, uh, Vice President of Channel Development and uh, been with Trade Centric for over two and a half years now. Again, as you mentioned back before when we were punch out to go at, at that time. Um, long time been in the e-procurement, e-commerce industry, uh, spent a lot of my career on the distributor side of things, really helping uh, companies grow and 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 really achieve success in both digital and e-procurement integration. And uh, kind of interesting though, is I actually started as a buyer. So started as one of those, you know, individuals trying to source products and 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 get, you know, everybody what they needed in a bank. Um, and after a short period of time, I really realized that uh, there was something else I needed a little bit more of and uh, ended up uh, starting my my career on on the supply side. So Really, again, happy to be here and excited to talk about the uh, topic today. And, and Beth, um, we're very excited that you're here and uh, love to just hear more about your journey to now CEO of, uh, of Trade Centric. 
Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and spend some time with you guys. Um, so, you know, my journey that led me to trade centric is is certainly an interesting one. I spent 25 years in hardware IT, you know, like a whole lifetime uh, working on the iconic ThinkPad brand at both IBM and Lenovo and really grew up in supply chain functions. So the procurement challenge really resonates with me, especially around margin, efficiency, affordability. So all of those buy side challenges, I sort of lived as a young engineer growing up in the organizations. Um, and then I made a transition into software and into e-commerce, and I spent six years on the on the B2C side uh, with Channel Advisor, really driving marketplaces and helping branded manufacturers really understand that there's a whole new world out there, that your e-commerce site may not be enough, and there are other channels you need to be considering. And so really developed a love for and an interest in e-commerce, and while there, we were really thinking about the B2B opportunity in marketplaces and how much more opportunity there was and maybe even more fracture and an opportunity to address that. And so Trade Centric really gives me the opportunity to kind of take that e-commerce knowledge, that background in procurement and brand and operations and marry it with B2B and um, really solving the challenges of B2B e-commerce and connected commerce. So. Um, I'm excited to be here and to take the helm. I know you met with Troy, who was my predecessor, who led us through uh, the rebrand and a whole number of growth phases uh, as a company. So I'm delighted to be here uh, to take the team forward. And honestly, I think uh, it was a little, you know, I'm always a little skeptical of the rebrands, but I get why you guys did it. You're you're more than what the, the name was, maybe too specific, punch out to go. And I think ultimately, uh, looking forward and where you are now, I feel like it's been pretty successful. I don't know if you can speak to that, but from my perspective, it's been perspective uh, per successful. But I'm on the outside, so I don't, <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> so, the yeah, name so I, I certainly would say yes. You know, I think that we've had. You know, we're still known as Punch Out to Go. So what an amazing reputation that was built um, on that brand and on that particular focus. Uh, but I think we're really much more broadly recognized now for the full suite of capability that we bring to the table. And so I definitely would consider the rebrand a success. And Kevin, I think you were going to add a comment to that. Yeah, I, I was just going to add, like, the fact that the Punch Out to Go name was, you know, around for so long and, and really helped a lot of suppliers. It's a name that at conferences we've had to continue to, to raise up and say, yeah, we're formally Punch Out to Go. Um, but the interesting piece of that is that when we changed our name, people came and said, wow, you guys can now do purchase orders and invoice integration, and you can do the entire supply chain and, and purchase to pay process. And we said, no, we've always been able to do that. It was just the name Punch Out to Go kind of pigeonholed us into one specific function, right? And not really the true scope of what we do. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in my experience too, and I've worked with a lot of people, even in like CPG, for example, where you, know, you become known for a product as opposed to the line of products. And it really is, it really yeah. is a similar situation that you folks were in. So I think it was it was a great idea. And you didn't come up with some name that was meaningless either. I think that that was actually a big yeah. positive from my branding perspective and my branding experience. Well, let's let's get into that because the, the concept <laughs> I want to talk about, uh, which makes we may end up spending the whole time on the podcast, is this idea of connected commerce. Mm -hmm. And I think um it's it's uh it's kind of a opaque but complex topic because everything is connected, but people don't really understand that how it's connected, right? Like even the basic Shopify websites are generally connected to the APIs of FedEx and UPS rates and whatever, you know, 50 other apps, honestly. I mean, even little small Shopify sites, I go in and they'll have 50 apps, right? And those apps are all connected to Shopify or maybe even to other systems, right? And I think in the, in the world of B2B, um, it's just, it, it, we need more connection, but it's very complicated and it's not a, usually as simple as installing a Shopify app. It's, it's usually a lot more complicated than that, <laughs> which is why people like you guys exist. Right. I think, uh, and that, uh, where would you, I guess, where would you start with that concept to, to, to explain that to someone in the B2B 
as a distributor, manufacturer, you know, B2B company. Yeah. Uh, so I, I can start off here a little bit and, and just talk about the term connected commerce, right? And, and how it originates, because, you know, I spent a long time in this space and you'll hear people talk to what we do as just punch out, right? As we were just discussing. Others call it e-procurement integration because that's just a single point of entry from a buyer. And there's even older B2B organizations that still call all the latest technology EDI. I mean, yeah. you listen to earnings reports and they'll say, well, our EDI numbers are, and, and it's really not EDI, right? So we call it connected commerce because it's really that entire procurement experience. It's the procure to pay, the bridging the gap between what a supplier and what a buyer needs to basically execute a successful transaction from the initial starting point, right? Searching and buying, finding products. So punch out through automating the entire purchase order experience, the order acknowledgements, the shipment notifications, and then finally through the invoice piece of it and automating the invoice. So, I mean, that's kind of what we see as the connected commerce and it's touching all these systems. So it's not just your commerce uh, platform, it's also your ERP, it's your order management system, it's your e-procurement platform, and it's also your financial systems from a buyer side. So the connected commerce is really bringing all these systems together to make that transaction process, that procure to pay process as seamless as possible. What about marketplaces or some of these people even creating, because a lot of distributors, I, I, I don't think they realize in my opinion, they're kind of like a curated marketplace. Like you're bringing together a bunch of vendors and helping supply that to your buyers. Like, are you guys getting involved with any of the, the big marketplaces or even helping these people build these into like digital marketplaces? Cause you see like a lot of these like drop shipping things where really there are all these like middlemen buying for the manufacturer, but then dropping it to the end customer. And a lot of it is just procurement in the end, right? If you think about it. Um, so I'm just curious like if that's coming up more and more for you guys. Yeah. We're spending a lot of time right now thinking about marketplaces and engaging with marketplaces to sort of understand where this is all headed. And we have a number of customers that are already, that are marketplaces that are already engaging because obviously punch out and this connected commerce concept is important to them, right? So we view marketplaces as kind of super suppliers. Right. So, you know, they're engaging maybe even a much larger number of buyers and offering a large assortment of products. And so, you know, what we do really is relevant to their um, business model. So Kevin's been at the helm of that research. So, Kevin, why don't you talk a little bit about that trend and what we see? Yeah. So and, and to Beth's point, right, we really spend a lot of time digging into marketplaces because we've seen success with our customers but we also see the challenges in the B2B space, right? Is that if I go to market as, as a true marketplace, what does my business model look like? And then to your point, Isaiah, how am I bringing all these other suppliers, these small sellers into the fold, right? And I'm, am I representing them as like a, you know, a single entity or the single source of truth? Or am I saying, I'm just bringing this up and I'm surfacing um, all these products for you, but you have to manage all the transactions and the invoicing and the purchase orders with everybody else in the marketplace. So what we're finding is that most successful marketplace, that B2B marketplace, is the one that's kind of unifying the experience. So to your point, being that like procurement experience where mm -hmm. if I'm cutting a PO, I'm cutting the PO to the marketplace. If I'm getting an invoice back, I'm getting an invoice back from the marketplace. I'm remitting to that marketplace. I'm not remitting it to all the suppliers on the back end, right? There's one single source of truth. And then whatever happens behind the scenes happens behind the scenes with the that's payer. Their, that's their problem. That's exactly. their value. Exactly. Problem, right? Yeah, that's their. Yep. Well, you know, I, I one of the, the good and the bad things about having had a long career is that I've seen like what it was sort of pre-internet or even pre a lot of technologies that people have become you know, familiar with. So my early career, I was in retail before I, you know, dove into e-commerce in 1999. So that's been a long time as well, but I was in retail and we used to have offices where there would be all of these binders, right? Lined up on shelves 
it probably hundreds of them and it was like every supplier for every little thing and they were all categorized by color and it's like i'll take down this binder and i'm flipping through and it's like how do i find the person for that belt and who is the manufacturer and you know it's of course we've come leaps and bounds from that but the but the big innovation i think in the last few years from all of my experience with people in b2b e-commerce is really the idea that you don't necessarily, even if you're responsible for a lot of these things in your business, you don't necessarily have to know the names and everything, you know, off the top of your head. You don't have to know the person you need to call or fax or whatever you used to do a million years ago. Now it should be more seamless. And if you need to know that person, if you need to know whoever that contact is, because some piece of the automation fails, then you go find it, right? But it's become that assumption now. You don't need to know, like, all right, it's on that shelf, you have five levels up and it's the red binder, right? Exactly. Yep. I just need to know that you have a place where I can find it and buy it. And if I pay you, you handle everything else. Exactly. And, and you know, the end consumer, the other thing I would just add to this, because I know we'll talk about it here, but sort of like the client or the end consumer, depending what this business might be, you know, is it, is it a service, is it a product, whatever they're dealing with, you know, they shouldn't have to see any of the pain or experience any of the pain or have any of the difficulty. I mean, it's, it's the conversations we've all been having, you know, last five, seven, however many years where I want to be able to pick up my phone for a B2C transaction and a B2B transaction and just make it happen. I don't want to have to jump through hoops or have somebody that I need to call or, you know, all this kind of stuff. So that's a big part of this as well. Okay. Two points I want to make. Um, I, I think it was, I forget who it was that I was talking to recently, but they're saying that, and they got this information, I think directly from some specialist researchers, maybe it was Gartner. And this is a pretty big, um, you know, hybrid manufacturer distributor. So they have the money to go get this research that 70% of their their buyers and in, in, in their industry, their 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 segment is now all millennials or younger. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, so that's one thing. One is like, and obviously it probably depends on your segment. Some are gonna be not 70% millennials, right? But it's going in that direction and they expect to buy online. Uh, and the second point I wanted to make, um, and I wanna get your guys' feedback is, um, so, um, but, you would think that's obvious. Oh, we got to invest in all this stuff and buy trade centric, hire Trellis to do, you know, a better B2B commerce website. Maybe to all of us, that's obvious. But I mean, I was just at um, a distribution event. I go, go to every year called TOG. It's a, a in for user group. So I've gotten, we have an integrate, a deep integration we built around uh, for e-commerce around this in for CSD product. So we're very well integrated into that space. And, you know, there's thousands of people using this uh, ERP. And I would say, like, I think the feedback we got is, like, almost half of them still don't even have an e-commerce website. Um, and then uh, I think it was, like, close to 90% are doing uh, less than 10% of their sales online. And so, and you had, like, one person, and this was a sub-study within in, in, uh, uh, of a group of them, only like one was like over 50% online and like a handful were like 10 to 50 in that range. So like my the point I'm making is like, why is it so, what, like, it feels like the technology is getting there, you know, Magento has gotten better, BigCommerce, Shopify is getting, adding B2B stuff, you have trade centric. I don't feel like the technology is the, the, the roadblock anymore. Um, although it's still, it's not free, it still costs money. What, why, why is it still so low in most of these distributors, manufacturers from a digital, where they're just doing EDI or what, what, what is stopping them, I guess? Well, I'll, I'll take a shot and Kevin, I know you have something to add here. You know, I think we talk a lot about, you know, the difference between our customers and what they've experienced in the transformation in their business and how much they're believers in the technology and connected commerce and how that's driving growth for their businesses and the difference between their perspective and a prospect that's much earlier in their journey that hasn't yet you know, experienced a full proactive program that's driving growth in their business, that's creating stickier customer relationships, all the things connected commerce does for you, right? There's a really big difference between 
believing that's going to happen and then experiencing it and not yet seeing that potential. And so there's this really big dis, uh, disconnect or inexperience, I guess I would call it. And so we spend a lot of time trying to share stories of our successful customers so that we can paint that picture for a new prospect that doesn't yet have that in their DNA or as part of their you know, business strategy, which we think is obviously imperative. And I would agree with you, the technology is there. Um, maybe it's old habits, right? So I come from a really large brand and they're, you know, they still do business in a wide range of ways, right? They'll take email orders, they'll take a phone call to a rep, they'll do EDI transactions, they'll do hosted catalogs, and they'll do punch out if that's the way you want to do it. So they're sort of like, we'll do it any way you want to not necessarily shifting all the way to an automated integrated order is better yet as a strategy. So I think that's that's pretty interesting. A bit of a cultural, there's a bit of a cultural gap there. I do think also that yeah. um, from our experience as a digital agency and as a service provider, there's also like this uh, lack of experience, I guess, to your point of like a crawl, walk, run approach where like, look, we need to maybe start with like, something small on the e-com side, maybe like one, you know, early stage product with trade centric. And like, that's, that's like step one. Right. But they're like, no, we want like Granger. And they're like, you know, they have nothing. So they're trying to go from like zero. To, it's like, you don't understand Granger spent $10 million in like 2009 on like a B2B commerce site. And they've been iterated for the last 15 years. You know, I have another one that's like, well, you know, we like four in print. You know, I don't know if you know four in print. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like, so do I. But they have a full engineering team. They've probably been building that site for 20 years. Like, you don't just build four in print on your first shot. Like, especially unless you have some crazy VC funding or whatever. These are, you know, which they don't have. Right. And so there's like a lack of experience from my perspective of like, what is MVP? How does MVP give me some value or at least get ROI and then iterate on top of that? Because it's an it's kind of a never ending journey, right? And I'm sure if you look at your best customers, they started somewhere and then continue to improve and add more features with what you guys do and all the other stuff. But there's like maybe it's a mix of the cultural lack of experience that just they don't they don't really know how to do that or even. And maybe that's why we need to educate people. That's part of why. That's well, part well, of let this me podcast. let me throw something else in the mix, and then I'll be interested in, in what yeah. Beth and Kevin have to say about it. I mean, part part of what I do, just to you know, to mention to you guys and a reminder, listeners, is is you know, I I consult right based on my experience. I've been I've been on the agency side. I've worked with tech companies. I've been a head of e-commerce and a head of marketing, like all these different things. So I've got the mix, right? But I'll go in and I'm often, I feel like I'm almost doing like a comedy routine in a way. Like I'm going in and I'm putting on a performance and I'm throwing cold water in people's faces saying, no, that's not the way that things work. It really is often a cultural thing before I go into the details of specifically how they need to address some of the issues that they might have or how they might get ahead of their competitor or or just meet the needs of their you know customers or current needs of the customers a lot of it i feel is cultural and, and it's almost a therapeutic role right j j like uh, isaiah and i've talked about this before you know it's it's like you you're almost being a therapist it's like no 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 you can make this change it will be all right people will thank you for it in the end so how do you feel the mixes between sort of cultural, you know, uh, the roadblocks and other roadblocks that preventing people from moving ahead and just doing the things that they should? So I can jump in on this one because uh, actually my team, we spent a lot of time in the last year and a half refining um, what we call a series of strategic workshops that we help our suppliers enable their organizations, right? And where do we spend the most time in? Enabling your sales team, identifying targets, and showing where you can grow. Because the biggest roadblock in a lot of these B2B organizations that have long-term sales strategies, sales selling organizations, right? They have large AEs, account management teams, whatever, they are very rigid in their processes and they do not believe 
that e-commerce is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And you could sit down at a table with a whole bunch of them and you can ask them about, you know, tell me about how I could help you with an e-commerce site or even a marketplace. And everybody will give you the reasons why not. And no one will tell you the reasons why it can work. Right. And, and that's big. So when you have your sales team, the revenue generator of your company chirping in your leadership's ear that you, you need me, you don't need this. There's a kind of trepidation. Do I really want to invest in this? Is this really the way we want to go? Because my sales team is telling me that their customer needs them. But then when you flip that and you go, you look at a McKinsey report that they did about two years ago. They're basically saying 80% of the buyers out there would switch suppliers if their current supplier didn't meet them in their digital channels that they wanted to buy in, mm -hmm. right? But that still doesn't resonate. Um, do, you, do you think that it's a fear, like they're going to lose their jobs and they know that it, it could work, but they don't want to get replaced? Or do you think they truly don't think it's going to work? I, I, I actually have two examples of that, right? And, and one is... My last role, I was working with companies trying to drive success of the platform that they rolled out. And when they, I asked them to walk me through their e-commerce experience and, you know, they were selling to owner operators of a particular line of business. And um, I, I said, you know, so walk me through this experience. And I said, oh, you have approval workflows, that's great. B2B companies really need approval workflows. And they said, the approval workflow is for our sales team. So what do you mean it's for your sales team? They said, well, yeah, we don't trust our customers to place an order directly in our systems. Our sales team needs to review them all before we release them. And you know, we walked through that about what, what, what kind of a barrier that was and how does that delay the process and when do your sales team approve the orders? But that, that they were making these advancements and moving forward and even considering a marketplace, yet their sales team still said that I need to be involved in this process because I don't trust my customer. I don't trust them to make the right decision. So there are some times that they're the barrier that they just feel like they're so close to the to the customer. But when I was mentioning the, the sessions that we do with sales teams of our customers, the one aha moment that we see the most is they're just like, this is gonna make my job easier. I'm going to be able to sell more now. And so you start that concept of you're going to go from an order taker to an order maker and they start seeing dollar signs. Next thing you know, they're on board. Yeah. They could be getting commissions in their sleep, right? Like literally like their customers, you know, especially small businesses. Me and my wife, um, mainly her runs a small Airbnb business on the side and she's essentially doing procurement at night. Like, but it's mostly like low level procurement through things, you know, the B2B Home Depot portal or whatever, right? And so <clears throat> they don't, a lot of people that are small don't want to have the rigidity of having to talk to a sales rep on working hours. Um, I think um, one thing that would be interesting, and I haven't quite figured out, and maybe you guys have some data on this, is like, do you have any anecdotal or even uh, research on the companies that are a little bit culturally ahead? and are taking e-commerce more seriously, maybe they have e-commerce, are they growing faster or doing better than the ones that are kind of like, cause I think that's another thing too. If you had, and people realize, look, the competition that's doing this is gonna kick our ass. Then that's also gonna kind of light a fire on them. And I think some of that's happening, but I'm not sure if the research is so accessible that people know how to figure that out, yeah. you know? We did a research study with a third party, Hops, and, and, you know, this is what they do. And so we gave them access to our customers. And so they talked to our customers about what were the results that they realized with an implementation. And we also had them look at by implementing which products. So if you do punch out only or if you do punch out PO and invoice and what are the returns. And, you know, the returns are almost so good that it's hard for a prospect to get their heads around it, right? So we found a minimum of 20% growth with existing customers just by hooking them up, right? Through connected commerce. Um, we found 80% efficiency gains in no more manual stuff, no more error resolution, no more manual PO processing, manual invoice reconciliation, like just the garbage of manual entry and uh, reconciliation, 80% improvement there. 
Um, and, you know, and we found that the higher end of those, you know, results realized happen when you automate all three things, right? Punch out PO and invoice, we're starting to call it the trifecta, <laughs> right? If you can get all those three things automated with your buyer, um, you get the most out of the efficiencies and you become a super sticky customer for them. Right. If you're captive in your buyer's procurement system and they're using punch out to gain access to you and your competitors are not there, guess who's going to get the business you are. And I can, you know, I can assure any supplier that if you're not there and you're not thinking about it, your competitors are. And once that buyer hooks up to somebody, they're not necessarily going to invest in hooking up to all five flavors of your competitors and giving you all an equal chance. Right. So it's really the, the, the ROI is not only there, it's, I think it's pretty intense and should be pretty motivating. What about on the e-commerce side of having a portal or uh, is there any, like other companies that maybe are ahead on kind of the front end or like that unified experience that you're talking about? Is Because I would imagine that they also have an advantage of being a little more modern or having more modern APIs or better ERP. Okay. There's probably also these legacy ERP companies I think are in trouble because it's hard to integrate with them. <laughs> they have no e-commerce website and a legacy ERP that has no APIs, you know? Is there, I'm just curious, is there any, that might be harder to track, but. I mean, so I, from from the uh, stat side, yes. I mean, it is, it is harder to track, but when we run into those experiences where someone's trying to build on an old tech stack and and, and trying to make it do something that it can't, we end up finding that those are the ones that those projects that extend into a longer period of time rather than saying, hey, you know what? You should have just taken a look at upgrading, you know, the back end when you did when you were holding on a front end. And it would have made everything a lot more easier to do. Um, and we're finding that some of our customers that are now doing that, right? And they're maybe moving from an old legacy back end platform to the suite of the uh, provider that they chose, right? So Salesforce, I'm now going to bring in the entire Salesforce suite, right? Those that are now moving to that are finding more success because now they're they're getting more real-time data feeds to the front end, right? They're putting, yeah. surfacing more information up to their customers. And again, they're seeing more people come and buy just on the, you know, the standalone site. And then those that can't move to the punch out site. And, you know, I, I think about the way that I used to do it at a previous company that I was at was we wanted to make sure that our, our e-commerce site was available to everyone. And for a long time, the company did not want to talk about that being the primary ordering method or the primary ordering channel. And so on any marketing material, commercials, anything they would say is they would say, call or stop by a location or contact your sales rep. Right. That was part of the typical marketing. And then all of a sudden there was this aha that, hey, our site has so many great features to it. We could actually drive growth through it. And what we started to see was when we started converting customers from that offline experience to online, we were growing at 4x. Right. And customers were seeing a lot more product that they never even thought we sold. Right. Next thing we started switching our marketing to click click our .com site today, right? Go search for the products on the .com site, everything focused around .com. Then all of a sudden we started seeing a lift in more and more traffic to the .com. And now you had that group that's on punch out or, or needed the connected commerce experience. So as we started focusing on that group, we found when building that tightly integrated experience, those customers were growing at 12X. Wow. And they were buying almost that's every that category mix, that we right? That's that, that's that mix of front end, you know, let's say maybe uh, do it yourself experience plus the back end connected commerce. And then you get like this astronomical kind of uh, mm -hmm. like combined effect, right? And yeah. I think well, and, and you know, the combined effect is is the thing that I wanted to comment on as well. I mean, the I've now worked with people in so many different sectors, it's crazy. So, but restaurant supply, plumbing, uh, a sprinkler supply, pool supplies, you know, oh, not electrical, lighting, all these different categories. And one thing that I think people are now realizing too is that when you have a million SKUs, 
even the best salespeople are not going to be able to say to their customers, oh, here are the 300 <laughs> things that you should get, you know, here, here it is, right? You know, you need these recommendation engines, you need better ways to search, yeah. you need better ways to filter and sort, whatever, right? Whatever it is that, that, or images, like how do you get the descriptions and the images and all of the product ID numbers and all these things organized in the appropriate ways out of your head as a great salesperson. Well, it's not going to happen to well, that. We're also, extent, we're also right? seeing a lot of um, uh, demand and, and it's an example of like maybe a phase two feature because people want it, but they can't even afford that or the phase one, right? But a diagram uh, like a a machine diagram and then you can kind of click on which we could build theoretically and we have done it where you can click on the part within the the full machine and then go yeah. to the part but it, like that experience is like a visual and i think a lot of people can understand it more easily but a sales rep can't do that a sales rep can't i mean they can like show you the diagram or give you the pdf but it's not well it's kind of like what beth and, and kevin have both been saying here too like the 8x, 12x, 80%, 20%. You know, the the numbers, it almost doesn't matter right now what the exact number is for a business to realize that the numbers are all X's, you know, like 1x, <laughs> 2x, 3x, 4 It doesn't matter. It's, it's, you got to take that leap and understand that you will, it's not just a maybe, you will actually get a benefit out of it. And the last thing I would throw in here too, just for conversation purposes, is that what salespeople have told me is it's given them the opportunity to just go after either new areas, entirely new areas they didn't have time for before, or to just spend the time necessary for the enormous sales. You know, things that are multi-million dollar. I talked with a woman who was working on a $60 million sale, you know, for her business. Well, you know what? That takes time. Instead of working on the Instead of working on the piddly little things that you'd have to approve, you know, or yeah. whatever. Well, I think it comes back to the, the point you raised earlier around culture, right? So it's interesting how the need for these things sort of rise up, right? So on the sales side, there's a need to accelerate sales, create stickier relationships, drive growth. On the supply chain side, there's all the efficiency, right? POs that fail, invoices that don't get paid, delayed DSO, right? Um, de delayed shipment, right? Or a failure to communicate shipment status, et cetera, right? So there's sort of, there's pain needs and there's opportunity needs. And one of the things we find when we think about, you know, assessing where a prospect's maturity is and where they are on their journey and how we can help them with the next step is really have they recognized that they need an e-commerce business leader? And is that business leader mm. pulling together the sales side of the house, the supply chain side of the house, and the IT team, right, to come forward and say, we need to be doing a better job here, right? There's not only a more efficient way, but there's a way that's going to drive a, you know, a growth flywheel here if we just enable it. Mm. And so that's an indicator to us, right? When we start to see you know, an e-com leader, when we start to see IT resources being allocated, when we start to see proactive strategies being put into place around how do we identify uh, buyers that want to connect with us, you know, and integrate their business, et cetera, right? How do we understand who those buyers are, how many they are? Let's create goals around that and start really creating a program that goes from I'll do business with you any way you want to, to no, I have a preference and I want to move towards this kind of opportunity. You know, I think that's where we start to see this culture shift happen and really see the benefits that we were talking about. I think that's a super important point, which is e-commerce needs a leader, right? And I think that all these, you know, B2B organizations, you know, generally they're sales led, like you said um, earlier. And Sometimes, well, one, those people maybe have no experience with e-commerce and they're not necessarily the right person to lead a full digital transformation. But then, you know, if you just leave it to, up to IT, my problem with the IT guys is they see it purely as a cost center and they're like, how can we get the cheapest software that, you know, and they try and do everything as if like, uh, you know, and not as an investment to grow. And it's a mix, right? It's sales and marketing and IT and operations and you need someone to bring that all together. I bet you, you know, I'd be a, if I was a betting man, which sometimes I bet a little bit, but not a lot. Uh, that oh. the B two B organizations with a director or VP of e commerce are growing faster 
or doing better overall than the ones that have no. And, uh, but what was kind of shocking to me at the uh, e-com event I was at, I'm sorry, the distribution event, probably only a handful of those companies had an e-commerce person, like much less than 50%, right? And so it sounds like to me, like just getting, start building an e-commerce organization is an immediate potential competitive advantage you could have as a B2B well, and, organization. I'll, I'll add this one tidbit too, that again, people may not know, but of the places I've been an actual head of e-commerce, I was the first head of e-commerce, you know, for many of these companies. And mm -hmm. that's astounding in a way, right? It's astounding. It is not 1999 anymore, right? Or 1998 <laughs> when everybody, when everything was the first, right? I mean, so these were in recent years. And so that really is, amazes me. You know, I'm very fortunate to have been able to do that and convince these people that they needed to. But really, it's kind of here we are, right? It's 2024, and people are having their first head of ecom. They had a head of marketing, they had a head of whatever IT and tech departments and developers and all these different things, but not a head of e-commerce. And, and it's funny you say that because in my past, right? So if I go back to when the dawn of the internet and the first team I started on was the e-commerce team. And then soon after they said, you know what, I think you need to be part of marketing. And then it was like, no, I think you need to be part of sales. <laughs> and then we got bought by somebody else and was like, you need to be part of the services organization. Oh and God, it was yeah. just like the hot potato because nobody knew about e-commerce. And you hope that as we continue and, and get more and more mature, people start to see that. And you know, I'm seeing a lot of now digital and marketing or someone that's like part of the revenue generation or emerging channel, someone that's like looking at all aspects of the business. And even that's a better role too, right? You know, if you can't get e-commerce and get me someone that's at least looking at what we should be doing and how we're forward thinking, because at least they have the ear of the C-suite to kind of talk to them about the opportunity. Yeah, I think this is so important because kind of back to a comment you made, Isaiah, you know, if we're talking to the IT department that's trying to automate a problem and looking for a piece of software that takes care of an issue, you know, that kind of lacks the bigger picture, right? So the way we think about things is you got to automate kind of the whole thing for it to really drive your business, but then you also need an analytics wrap around it that's going to help you do vendor management, right? It's going to help you look at your buyers, look at buying patterns, see if something's changed dramatically so you can go engage with the buyer and understand what's going on, right? Give you those signals, see if there's a spike, see if you've got demand changes on certain of your products that might give you an indicator that you got a live one or that you got a dog that needs to be addressed, right? So there's there's data that comes with these integrated programs. We give you abandoned cart information, right? That you might not have had before. So you can actually see what somebody shopped for, but then failed to purchase and understand why that is, right? So as you think about automating a solve like this or automating a solve like this, that gives you real data to drive business and drive business growth, that requires an e-com leader that's yeah. thinking about how do I put these pieces together so that I can actually go drive a growth. Well, you said it's really important, seeing that abandoned cart information or whatever else it may be, whatever they ordered, that can go to the sales rep. So then the sales rep can upsell or why did you abandon this? Maybe they just forgot, but they, or they weren't confident and they like, that's where, that's where I think the merging of sales and marketing and e-commerce can come together and mm -hmm. sales can actually have, because right now, most of these companies, it's like they have this basic ERP data that hasn't been analyzed and no one's doing any thoughtful analysis on the buying behavior because these ERPs weren't designed for that, right? They're just order taker systems that are not, not really that uh, powerful for that. I mean, I'm sure there's modules and things you can add, but um, sure. yeah. But yeah, th there's so much to... Uh, um, we have a little bit more time, but I want to make sure um, we kind of answered uh, the questions I wanted to get to without um, <laughs> actually answering them. Uh, one of the ones we didn't answer uh, or ask is um, what are some of the pitfalls? And I think we sort of answered this, but not directly. What are some of the pitfalls that you see these companies make with B2B e-commerce that they just never get off the ground. Uh, they never, they don't get as far as some of your maybe more successful customers. 
Yeah, so, I, we definitely have some ideas here. So Kevin, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I can jump in first and and because um, I'm thinking about something that, that your company does, Isaiah, right? And that's, you know, designing the right experience. So if, if you think about what success means in connected commerce, you have to start with a good platform, right? And a lot of times the biggest pitfall is someone comes out of the gate and says, well, I, I bought this package and this is what it works on the B2C side, right? And I can take a credit card and they forget about all the other robust features, right? Everything that I need from handling bulk orders to repeat purchases to what's my negotiated pricing. I know I saw you posted something about that recently about B2B organizations don't understand how many different levels of custom pricing that they may need to offer the organizations they sell to. Well, you need a platform that can extend that out and not just- Not as simple as they, yeah. I mean, what happens yeah. is to that point is they go and buy a cheap uh, solution, but they never uh, thought about the company accounts and company pricing. And well, let's say NetSuite does it a little differently. And now you need NetSuite's version to go into the e-com version. And then they buy some app that supposedly does it, but the app doesn't actually do that feature. The app only does- list price and then when they and so as to your point they haven't thought about all these user experience nuances and they get locked into a corner and unwinding that sometimes for us our quote is more than what they paid for originally <laughs> exactly exactly and and the other big area that we see too is custom catalog capabilities I need to build restrictions and I don't want to order all million products. I want to roll out a pro program that only gives me access to 300,000, right? And and there's, again, I didn't even think about including that in my platform. I don't know how to do it. And shouldn't you just have good data governance and good user governance and this big, you know, trust everybody to be a good corporate soldier and only buy the products that they should, right? That's a great theory, but it doesn't always work in B2B. Well, well people don't realize in e-commerce, and I, I want to add some light to this, is that most of these e-commerce platforms are not built for B2B. So all these features, Shopify has a new B2B company accounts feature. I, I'll take a little credit. I think I pretty much convinced big commerce to build their B2B edition, although they might not admit that, but uh, their B2B edition is not, they didn't start with that, right? And so the company accounts, all these things, Magento didn't start with B2B uh, company accounts. They acquired a company and then they built it and it's grown. Um, I'll give a little shout out to Oro because Oro has built B2B from the day ground up. But as we both, I think all know, Shopify, BigCommerce, Magento, kind of the, and even Salesforce didn't start as B2B, although they acquired. So the problem that these companies don't understand is that you have to understand that you, one, you might even have to upgrade to the right version to get this feature. And it's not like the most straightforward, most of the agencies don't know how to use it because they didn't grow up using these features. And then most of the integrations that are pre-built or that claim to do this stuff don't really do it because they built it before these features even exist or it's harder to do and they don't include those features out of the box. And so all these little nuances that you're mentioning that's why I think a lot of these companies, the, the you know, the project might be two hundred thousand, but they were quoted fifty grand because, but what they were really quoted for is a B two C website, and they and then they're like, and then they don't get success because they built a B two C website and they're a B two B company, and they're wondering, oh, it doesn't work, but it it does work. You just didn't, you just did it wrong, <laughs> and so, but I think you're making a really important point, which is require like upfront requirements capturing and thoughtful leadership up front is really the solution to that. Yeah. I, I want to add one other pitfall to the mix just before we wrap this piece up. I mean, I uh, what I often see, we talk about clients and customers a lot, you know, and a lot of great, very successful businesses talk about them too, but they don't often have a, a, an organized process to get that feedback from the customers other than maybe surveys, right? Which is not enough, right? You need to have, I call them like client councils or customer councils, where you bring in people who are, you know, maybe the top tier, the middle tier, and maybe smaller customers who are newer to the business. And you're constantly getting feedback out of them, you know, and you're bouncing things again off of them. And you're saying, what do you think? And what do you want? And what is missing? 
And the companies that are really doing that, I think, are are doing better, you know, quarter over quarter and year over year than the companies that aren't, uh, you know, because they're, they're they have to hear, you know, it's, and it's what Isaiah, what you said earlier about, you know, seventy percent or eighty percent of millennials, and you know, all of the, I mean, the younger generations are the ones who are spending the money, you know, and making the decisions often, and they have expectations, and those expectations have to be known before they can be met. Right. So these businesses just really the pitfall is not, you know, getting all of the feedback that they could. Uh, Beth, I want to give you a chance to answer this because we <laughs> we dropped, we went on for <laughs> a little bit longer there. So no, that's, that's <laughs> I think there's um, a real pitfall that falling into a reactive um, strategy and then deciding that you maybe you have some IT capability and so you have customers that have demands and you start reacting to those demands and you just immediately start building one-to-one, one-off integrations without really thinking through a broader strategy. You know, we've been the benefit of a number of customers that have come to us and said, I created this thing and now I can't maintain it. <laughs> right? And I think maybe I want to grow it because it's actually given me something interesting. I, I can't define it because I can't see the metrics, but I'm seeing some growth and I really want to do more with it. But can you please help me? So I think sort of accidentally falling into a DIY strategy um, can become overwhelming if you start to get a really successful program. So I think, you know, I, I guess the pitfall is maybe not thinking it through, thinking I'm going to accommodate a buyer or two, and I'm going to do this thing they need me to do, but not really thinking about what is that broader set of capability that's going to be expected of me? And what is that broader potential, right? Because I think if you really spend the time, right? You know, we've converted a number of DIYers to very successful customers um, where they're much happier to have us maintain all the complexity of those connections and spin them up much faster than they could do with a dedicated IT team. So I think that fall of falling into reacting to your buyer instead of having a proactive strategy is a real, it can become a real gotcha. I, I think that's a really important point is, yeah, by being reactive, you're just building maybe the feature and then you build it, <laughs> go to IT, they try and build it in the cheapest way <laughs> possible, but that doesn't think about the the platform effects. And I think you need a mix, right? I mean, you do need some internal resources, the e manager, and yeah. a lot of our best clients uh, have development teams. Like, and sometimes they pay us a lot of money to augment those teams because those teams get busy and they can maybe we're better at certain things so like we're embracing working a lot more with these like deep deep uh do-it-yourself kind of companies right because to your point some of them are coming to us because they're realizing well we custom build all these things but maybe half of this shouldn't be custom anymore half of it should be trade centric and big commerce or whatever you know I think all of it should be trade centric. <laughs> Please call Beth and Kevin, right? Uh, after- but to that point, I think that <laughs> it's so complicated. There is no, there's no one magic solution, right? Like the the ERP can only do so much. You know, uh, you guys do a lot, but you you know you're not going to replace a big commerce, right? And I think that that's part of the problem is there's so many things out there. You need a lot of different conversations and kind of a, a vision of, of an architecture of all of how you're going to start to use all these different software together um, because it, it can get pretty complicated pretty fast. And I also see a lot of people buying things they don't need because they're like, Oh, we need a pin. Well, a pin houses my product data. Well, okay. Now you have product data in a database. That's a little bit nicer than your ERP. Is that actually helping your business, right? Like they, they haven't thought through the, the mechanisms of all these different things. And so to your point, I think there needs to be kind of an upfront architecture strategy. Like, mm-hmm. and, it, and it, it's probably a little bit more of a lengthy process than I think people are willing to accept right now in the market. Like you probably need months of time. And we see this sometimes where they mm-hmm. they're like, oh, we're gonna do discovery for a month, but it turns into six months because we uncover so many problems with their business that there's no way we could possibly devise a solution in a month because they have to select 10 vendors and selecting 10 new vendor, 10 new software vendors 
can take a long time because you have to maybe vet five different solutions per per category, you know, and get pricing and like all these things. Just it, it's a lot of work, right? And so, yeah, I, think I really think that it's true, right? Like it, depending on where a customer is on their maturity, you know, a, a much more mature customer that's been running a DIY program that's just gotten too complex for them is a very educated buyer. Right. So they really know what they need. They know what they've tried. They know what they don't need. Yeah. And so that, that's a customer that's in a different well, place. I, I would actually my point to that, though, is sometimes they're so deep uh, uh, do it yourself uh, that they've never even explored the vendor marketplace, really. And sometimes right. they need a lot of education on that, from my experience. But it, some of them, you're right, are very, they're smart and they know how to, they know how to do it quickly. But yeah, I was sort of going to lead to the point of, you know, companies like yours, system integrators that are very educated in the space can, it can really help um, these customers kind of assess all the different things they need, help with the architecture. We participate a lot in this, right? So Kevin's team and our solution architects spend a lot of time trying to figure out, okay, what do you got? What don't you have? And let's figure out how to put those pieces together. And some of that is just us making recommendations. This is work you got to go do now. So we, would, we can suggest partners, we can suggest solutions, but they're outside of the trade centric wheelhouse. And this yeah. is what we're going to focus on and how we're going to enable you, but you're missing two more pieces. So let's go put that together. And yeah, that can make a project take longer, but it will make the project more successful. So I think it's important for a supplier that's sort of thinking about their strategy to recognize what they know and what they don't know and where they can use advice, right, from the industry to sort of help them make educated decisions. And so we work a lot, right, with consultants that are advising our customers or system, you know, system integrators that are putting together solutions so that we can help advise on what is the right set of solutions to put together and what order of operations when you think about deployment makes sense. Um, so I think, you know, the old saying, it takes a village. We certainly see that to be true. <laughs> uh, uh, Kevin, I'm curious, is there any common gaps that you see? Beth, you mentioned there's all these gaps. I'm sure it ranges from massive gaps to maybe just a couple little things, but I'm just curious if there's any commonalities that you see, Kevin, of like, oh, they mostly need to upgrade their ERP or what, whatever you might see the most common in the gaps? Um, I would say, I, th I think, fortunately, most common is they didn't think through the, the whole pricing game and being able to, to display like real-time pricing. Mm -hmm. um, it's harder than, I've been doing it for almost 10 years. Doing It's, it's a hard problem to solve B2B real-time pricing because anyways, we could spend a whole podcast on that. <laughs> that that and, and, and inventory is the next one. So again, especially since COVID, everybody wants to see inventory. Everybody wants to see it into the supply chain. And you have suppliers saying, well, I haven't solved that yet. And you get buyers that say, well, why would I buy on your site then? Like, what, what, what are you doing? How are you helping me? So the disconnect between the product, the pricing and the availability still exists for some, right? And and they're trying to solve it, but they always don't know the most effective way to do it. Especially those that have like multiple dealer network or multiple um, location network that they don't know how to tie into. You think also some of it is just legacy ERP infrastructure, or legacy software that doesn't really support good kind of real-time availability. That's, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that's part of it too. Yep, oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, they, they've acquired a lot of companies and now they've, that, we, we put that off, we put that off and now all of a sudden they want to expose the availability in all the different locations and everybody runs on a different ERP and there's nothing that sits on top of it to kind of um, unify it all. I, I really think that um, this stuff is all going to become table stakes. Like I, I, what you guys said, I think is really powerful with like um, how the e -com drove 4X and then when they did the connected commerce, it was another 8X and you know, all of a sudden you can get to like 20 X or, you know, these astronomical numbers. And I really believe, uh, I guess I want to get your guys feedback on uh, kind of to wrap up. I really believe that that's going to become the table stakes, which is a good e-commerce experience, a unified experience with real time pricing, company specific pricing and inventory. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe an Amazon light experience, not like pure Amazon, but some of the base features you get on the Amazon plus, all, all of that on the you know e-com side plus the whole connected commerce. I think that's going to become 
the table stakes. And I'm I'm convinced that in the next, let's say, five to ten years, let's say ten years, because this moves slower than we we think, but within 10 years, the company's not doing this. Like we might see like almost like a B2B apocalypse, kind of like what we saw with retail, where the retail, I don't know if you remember the retail apocalypse, um, where they will basically start to become, you know, more or less irrelevant if they can't hit those table stakes. We'll uh, save that for our thousandth episode in 10 years. We'll yeah, our thousandth episode. <laughs> We've hit, the, we've hit the precipice, but I just- We'll be back for that. Um, we'll so invite you all back. It's interesting what you're saying. I was talking to a prospect uh, about a week ago, and he shared with me that a year ago, 10% of his RFPs were requesting punch up. <laughs> and now it's 90%. Yeah. And so, and he is not yet able to offer punch out capability. And so we are obviously working with them because he yeah. said, I can no longer respond truthfully to RFPs about my capability because I can't offer what they're looking for. And so that's, that's a pretty big shift in the last year um, on demand, you know, from his perspective, it's just an indicator. So we would agree with you. Like, like part of me says it can't stay the way it is. Like, like we can't really keep taking orders through email and phone calls. Like this is ridiculous. And the buyer is changing, right? I, just want to ask, I mean, how much fraud could be going through email and phone? Like mm -hmm. in terms of scams, and, it, right? right? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just... No, but how do you control spend that's going through email and phone? Like, think about why ePro exists, right? You're trying to get it all where you can see it so you can control it, right? What you measure, you manage, right? Um, and so, you know, it, it can't stay the way it is. So I would agree that we're on this kind of precipice. And I think for me, a big takeaway is if you don't have a strategy for how you're going to do this, and how you're going to accelerate quickly, right? We've talked about how long companies have been in this game. You guys talked about Granger and their expertise, and, and they're still encountering challenges, right? They have this big DIY thing, and even it's not perfect, right? So no. experts in the business, right? So if you're not started, your competitors are going to beat you out. So, you know, we would just say, get started, <laughs> right? Get good advice and get started because you're going to get out, um, out won by your competition. Oh, God, yeah. right? Yeah. You're going to be, you're going to be coming up to a, a gunfight with a knife or I guess even less, you know, a, a dull knife. <laughs> the, I, I'm going to totally support you, Beth, in that. Get started is yeah. is really, uh, yeah. you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I say that and how many different ways I say that, you know, when I just go <laughs> to talk to people. It's like, just just begin, start now. Let's do it. Let's take a step. You know, it's like, yeah. it's always, Everybody it's always that starts, conversation. Right. Everybody starts somewhere, right? Yeah, and so exactly. we're trying to get much better at understanding exactly where a prospect is so that we can be articulate on, okay, for you, based on where you are, these are the next three steps that really make sense to us based on the, you know, thousands of customers we've interacted with. So like, you know, we're trying to get much better at meeting a prospect where they are so we can be helpful and advancing their journey. And I think, you know, just get moving, right? And get the right advice and start with one supplier, you know, start with one buyer. <laughs> one supplier, right? maybe like one. Going. Maybe list price if pricing's too hard to do, and right. you know small customers can buy, I don't know can buy on your tiered pricing list. I don't know, right? Like there's to your point, there's ways to get started, and I think Kevin, you brought, your point is important, but they might see that as a failure. But in my opinion, you have to get started with these mini failures because that's how you get to success, right? They build up thing. Oh, we didn't think through company specific pricing, but now you know that that's a hard problem to solve, mm -hmm. and now you know maybe we need to upgrade the ERP or. We have to work around it temporarily, like, but you're never going to even find that stuff out until you get started, right? And the longer I think you wait to get started, that's why I think that this stuff is hard. And if they wait too long, there will be like a no catch up point because companies that have been doing this for 10 years, let's say in 10 years, you won't just be able to catch up in a year, you know, like you won't just be able to build that culture in a couple of years. It'll be too hard. You know? Well, one thing we didn't talk about is not all buyers are created equal either, right? So not all buyers are ready to do this connected commerce thing in a perfect way. So we've seen prospects pick the wrong buyer and that never gets up and running. And so then they decide this thing isn't for them and it's not going to work. 
And so we always recommend you should have a set of target buyers and you should be talking to them and understand which ones are more likely to be successful. So you want to start with a buyer that's going to connect up and get going and where you can start building momentum and then expand from there. So who you pick to partner with as you're building your connected commerce program we, is every bit as important, right? As just having one, right? So um, and what we encourage, I mean, it's part of what Kevin does for a living, is we spend a lot of time saying, who do we already have connected to our network that is a buyer of yours already, um, that we know we've connected to somebody else, so if we can connect them to you, you're going to automatically see yeah. this take off. That was going to be my right? comment, is I would assume that you want to get started with someone that's maybe already done this before or has some experience, like, you know, if you start with some legacy manufacturer that has never done this, it's probably going to be a lot harder than someone already that's up and running with trade centric, right? Yeah. Absolutely. It just takes you longer to get your flywheel going. And, and especially if you're building organization awareness and you're trying to build a culture around this, you need a successful program. And so who you choose and pick somebody with some volume, right? So that when you see the results, the organization feels it and goes, oh, wait, we should allocate more resource to this, right? So you got to have some successes early right, to create that cultural belief system around this. So you gotta be crafty, right? You gotta have a strategy and you gotta pick pick the right horses. So. Well, well, I just wanna give you guys a big thank you. And and uh, really, I think this is a great podcast. And I think folks are really gonna get a lot out of it. If there Are there any final words before we wrap up? I think these were some really good uh, comments that we got here today. I mean, I think I would just say first, thanks for having us and having us back on our anniversary um, and for welcoming me right to the community. So I'm excited um, to meet and be part of it. Um, and I guess I would just leave with, you know, we've got concrete proof through our ROI study that suppliers that engage in connected commerce are going to see benefits and uh, going to see their business grow. And so we have a belief system around it. And so we would just love to see you know, in this space where there's so much fracture and there's so many that haven't even started, like get started, you're going to see benefits for your business. We know you will. So just have a conversation, right? Like you guys are very willing to give good information for free, <laughs> like in this, in the sales process. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so just even, I think a lot of companies don't realize you could just, just start talking to these vendors and you'll learn just from that. You know, so. for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. It's great to see you.